Welcome to episode five of the Go Get a Mobility podcast. My name is Margaret Hughes, and I'm here with my daughter, Emma Hughes. Hi, Emma. Hi, everybody. I am pleased to tell you that today, me and Emma are sitting in person. Yes. Uh, normally, uh, for the last four podcasts, Emma has been in England at school, and we've been doing our podcast via Zoom. And today, we are in person together because Emma is home for the summer. Yes. So exciting. Today, we are talking about when and why not to correct mistakes made in agility. So either handling mistakes or dog mistakes that happen when you're training, um, or you know, we could also talk about when you're trialing and when do you fix and when do you not fix. And so knowing when to do that and how to keep going, um, you have to practice it first in training and then you can do it in a trial. So here's one thing that is very important to know is that when you make the decision to correct a mistake, you are almost always going to affect the dog in some way. So either the dog will become frustrated or the dog will drop their drive to continue on because in the dog's mind, when they are moving forward and attempting to uh, go over a jump or attempting to go into a, a tunnel, they think they're right, right? And then if all of a sudden the owner's like, oh, you missed that jump because you wanted them on the backside versus the front side, and, and the handler physically and verbally tells the dog that they're wrong, that can have some really dire consequences for the dog when they're running. Especially because dogs don't do things in agility to frustrate us, right? A dog will not go into the wrong end of a tunnel and think, oh, you know, what will really grind her gears is if I get this obstacle wrong. Right. Um, and so dogs don't know. They don't even know that it's for trials. They don't know it's for ribbons. They just know that they're having fun. Right. And so learning to read your dog and learning to understand when to correct something and when not to really is an individual uh, assessment that you have to do with your own dog handler team. And not only that, within that dog handler team, it will depend on what you are working on, right? right? So if, they, if they've been working on a skill that you know they've got this, then yeah, maybe that's the time to correct it and pull them back and, and ask them to do it again. So when do you know that you should correct a dog or not correct a dog? What information does the dog give you? Or as a, as a handler, when do you care and when do you not care that they get something wrong? Right, that's a really good question. And I also think it depends on what we're training, um, especially with something that I know that Dot knows. Um, so for example, back size or something that she's very, very good at. And oftentimes I won't, really get too much in a fit if she misses a backside because I know that she knows it right and so especially in training especially in training sometimes I'll just skip backside altogether like if she just takes the front side I'm like okay whatever I have something more important to work on down the line you know two jumps later right so I'd rather work on two jumps later problem than make the backside into a problem when I know that it's not right Exactly. So if you've got a goal in mind, so you have to have a goal, right? right? When you're, yeah. when you're training, go into your training with a goal and also be flexible that if the goal that you're going for is being hampered by something, you know, three obstacles prior, how much does that matter? Right. So if it's, a, yeah. if it's a backside that you don't be like, okay, so they didn't get that no big deal in general, they know their backsides in general, they listen to their backsides, they have an understanding of it. Do you stop your training to fix it or continue on towards the, the goal that you had in mind when you set out for that training? When I'm training with my students, it can often crop up that we go for X, Y, Z in a training scenario, but all of a sudden the dog won't send to a tunnel or right. won't send to a jump. And we have to switch gears to work on the send to the tunnel or the send to the backside 
because without that, we can't get A, B, and C. Right, and that can be very frustrating as a handler too. You know, if you have gotten very excited about wanting to train something, you've set out, you know, you're standing in the middle of the agility field and you're really excited to try this new thing and you find out your dog can't even get the foundation for it for you to actually execute your new and exciting move. That's very frustrating as a handler. And I think a lot of dogs pick up on that. And the most important thing to know for me anyway, is that the dog doesn't know that they're wrong, right? So the dog doesn't know why they're wrong and they don't know why we're frustrated at them. And that can kind of cause a lot of, um, uh, what's it called? That can, that can cause a lot of uh, loss of drive. And then in turn, us as handlers will get frustrated because the dog's not driving as much as they normally would. And it just kind of snowballs. And all of a sudden you're stood there angry and frustrated that you can't get this one thing. And you realize, I don't even remember what my goal was. Oh, golly. Yeah. And, and if, if you don't know what your goal is, your dog definitely doesn't know what your goal is. Uh, and when you're, when you're getting frustrated as a handler, I think it is imperative that you set those feelings aside and you look at what is the attitude of your dog and continue to train for a joyful happy dog versus a dog that is doing a, a, a technical skill but is not doing it willingly or with a happy attitude but is just executing x y and z to accommodate your frustration, right? Yeah. How do we know when to let go of a training scenario that won't matter in the long run to hone in on a skill that we want, a, a concept that we want to get? Right. I go by an, a 2080 rule. So if my dog is getting what I'm asking them to do 80% of the time, I think that's a pretty good dang ratio. Uh, and if my dog is, if I'm asking my dog to do something and I've asked them multiple times for it and I think that they have it, then I think by the second, third try, if they're telling me that they don't have it, then I need to listen to that. I need to slow it down. I need to either slow down the technical part of the skill, or I need to, um, make the skill the clarity of the skill right, and the, exe foundation. the execution of the skill um, with more clarity so that my dog doesn't get frustrated and keeping in mind that if i normally work my start line with some motion that if i'm asking him with for it with strictly a verbal that i've changed the criteria on my dog and that they're going to get frustrated and not understand what I'm asking. If I normally ask for the tunnel send with motion, and now I'm just asking for it with a pure verbal. And it's kind of hard. You have to switch gears as a handler, and then in turn, your dog has to switch gears as well. Because you know, in agility, we're always looking at the little things constantly. You know, always little puzzle pieces come together to build a big course, right? And in this instance, we're looking at the big picture, right? And the big picture is what's your goal. And so sometimes the little steps up to that goal need to be changed. And in turn, the goal needs to be changed. Right. And that's really, really, really hard to do, especially, you know, if you're excited about it. Um, I know that when I walked um, into running new dogs, so dogs that I don't know at all, um, sometimes I'll run other people's dogs. A big one was with um, the poodle that I ran um, in the Netherlands. I started my goal with wanting to run really clean and run really fast and run really well. And this and is this is a dog that's well skilled. Yes, this is a dog that has been on multiple world teams and knows all the obstacles, knows all her commands, and she's great. Um, and I started, you know, I wanted to run clean. And about 30 seconds into it, my goal changed immediately. And it was, okay, how can this dog stay with me? Right. How can this dog even look me in the eyes and say, okay, yes, I would like to run with you? And so, you know, you have to change your goal and changing a goal from a dog staying with you or sorry, to a dog staying with you from the broader course is a very, very hard thing to do. So I think that as handlers that building that relationship is by far job number one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Job number one, you have to build that relationship and not only with you running other people's dogs or me running with other people's dogs is the relationship at the 
core essence of being able to do that. Same with handlers and their own dogs. Oh yeah. If the relationship is starting to break down, the relationship has to be rebuilt. And every single time that you correct a dog on course, you tell them that they're wrong, either by uh, slowing down and, and uh, uh, deselling real quick and stopping the run altogether, or by uh, verbally telling them, oh, no, 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 that's wrong, or, ah, you know, whatever your no indication is, you're taking a chunk of the relationship and you're, you're, you're breaking into it. And so every time you break into that relationship uh, or, or break up the relationship a little bit, you have to repair it. Yeah. Um, and so you can repair it in a number of ways, but if you don't have a solid history of a good relationship, correcting for mistakes on course can become an aversive to the dog. Yeah. And um, you can actually see that on some of my runs with Dot. When I was, um, Dot is really my only second agility dog. Um, and so she was kind of my guinea pig in the ways of, I finally knew what I was doing, kind of. And so she was the more advanced dog, um, you know, compared to Millie, who I had when I was four. So Dottie, uh, I accidentally taught Dottie to think too much because I kept telling her that she was wrong when she was young. Um, and so I got very, very worried about her not understanding things. And so I would tell her that she was wrong. And it took quite a while to get her out of thinking too much because then she would start to assume that she was wrong instead of me telling her that she was wrong and she'd stop you know in the middle of the course and she'd think um she did it a lot with contacts and she did it a lot with backsides and she started to guess and then it just kind of became sporadic and all of a sudden i didn't have control over my dog anymore and um, and so that wasn't um you know i never got mad at her but i would tell her that she was wrong and so she started to think and we lost a lot of drive because of that and we started a lot of guessing games because of that as well yeah and you had to do some repair work and building yeah. that drive back yeah. up so i think my point is is if you tell your dogs wrong if you tell your dog that they're wrong you have to tell them what's right so i was telling dotty that she was wrong but i wasn't telling her what she could be doing to do right and so she would just start guessing right correct yeah good point all right so here's a scenario you have in in akc you have a, a few refusals that you're allowed to have and a few uh, one or one wrong course that you're allowed to have in in the, lower levels. in the lower levels in certain classes so if a title is on the line or a queue is on the line is it worth it to fix that mistake to get the queue that's a great question i think in my my personal greedy handler experience, I would um, and I would not let Dottie know that she is wrong. So she comes out of the wrong end of a tunnel. And I'm like, oh, look at you. I flip her around and I put her right back. in. She has no idea that she's wrong. OK, so OK, so yeah, that works. Um, and so I don't know that it's so much fixing the mistake is how you fix the mistake right right yeah. so can you fix the mistake and still cue so your dog's gotten a refusal can you fix the mistake without letting your dog know can you fix the mistake and keep the joyful energy and drive that your dog has flowing or does the mistake just bring your dog back well, it depends on how you depends, bring how you bring them back. It depends on you and your dog, you know, because if you know that you're going to get really, uh, if you know that you're going to turn off like a light switch when your dog makes that mistake, and while you're bringing them back, they're going to realize that they're wrong, and they're going to shut down. Maybe you shouldn't correct them. Absolutely. Right. Like I know, like when I ran Hetty, I thought you know she missed that jump, but I can't really turn around because that D cell is going to send her right back, you know, to her owner. Right. And, and not only um, I, are we worried about the shutdown, the shutdown, you have to preserve the non shutdown dog, <laughs> yeah. right? Preserve the joy, preserve the, the happy attitude in lieu of the cue. Right. So if your dog, if you can bring your dog back from a mistake and keep preserve 
the attitude and keep it happy and lively, then sure, go ahead and fix it. But if you can't, if you, if you just mentally, you can't, you haven't practiced it, then don't, don't sacrifice your dog's attitude for the cue. It's not worth it for the next cue and the next cue after that and the, or the run, it's not worth it for the run after that and the run after that. Because if your dog figures out that when you get frustrated, they get pulled back, then it's going to show up again in another run in another trial. And we're talking, I, I'm most, I'm most worried about dogs that shut down. Yeah. Those are the yeah. ones that I want to preserve the dogs that are, that trigger high, that, you know, become a uh, bitey, barky, they, they are perimeter searchers. Yeah, if they're dotty, they'll grab under your ankles and they don't like Yeah. Them. So, so if they stress high, then I'm not as worried about correcting a mistake as a dog that corrects low. Um, a dog that, that shuts down is harder to bring back up than a dog that stresses high and you need to uh, get the impulse control going with uh, bringing them back to, to center ground. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about dogs that shut down, dogs that don't have a whole lot of drive, that if you decel extreme on them, they're hard to get back going those are the dogs that i want to preserve their attitude i want to preserve their joy i want to preserve this the high stressing dogs as well but in a different way right, right? there are different kettle of fish that we're talking about and here's the clincher dogs can stress both ways one dog can stress both ways this week they stress high this week they stress low and so you have to learn as a handler how to read that and how to adjust your training for the dog that you are presented with right. on the day of training, on the day of the trial, because it can change like the wind and it will change over the dog's lifetime. So the more success the dog has in, in keeping their, their joy and their attitude up from beginning to end, the more that's gonna snowball into beginning to end. But if anything chunks into that confidence and drops that confidence down, Oh, you got some rebuilding to do. You've got some rebuilding to do. So you can have a dog that stresses high and you can drop them down to stress low with overcorrections, with right. over fixing mistakes, with over fixing refusals and wrong courses. So I guess the takeaway here is does your dog do it for you or do they do it for them? And if they do it for you, maybe you shouldn't tell them that uh, they're wrong. That's the takeaway. That's my takeaway. Right? <laughs> like I know when Jinx was first starting out, he did it for us. He stayed with us because we asked him to, and that was very good of him. And so then in turn, asking him to stay with us and complete a novice course, that was too much. And he was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go look for my dad. I'll see you guys later. And so that becomes your goal, right? Can Jinx stay with us? And then a year later, your goal becomes, okay, Jinx is staying with us. Can he complete his weave pulls? Okay, six months later, Jinx completes his weave pulls. Can he do his contacts? And then all of a sudden, you've got an agility dog on your hands. Yeah, so it's spinning plates, keeping the plates spinning right. in the air and keeping all of them with a joyful attitude along with technical skill. Right, yes. Yeah. My takeaway from this is preserve your dog's attitude that is job number one continue to train for the technical skills but don't sacrifice your dog's attitude and joy in the meantime i agree you, you have to have both you have to have both and if and if your dog's happiness and attitude uh, uh isn't isn't in place you have some relationship building to do the relationship needs to be strong so that the off leash training can happen and the off-leash training needs to happen so that the technical skills can happen and the technical skills can't be so overwhelmingly difficult that the dog starts to shut down go for small technical and piece them together like the puzzle yeah right yeah. put the puzzle together but if you push too hard you're going to push that puzzle right off the table and a whole bunch of pieces are going to fall on the floor and you have to pick it up 
and put them back together again. But once you know what pieces go in what corner <laughs> that just fell on the floor, it will be easier to rebuild it. <laughs> yeah. Right? I agree. You once said, at what point does correcting the dog become too rigid? And at what point does your lenience become too sloppy? Gotta find that middle ground. Yeah, you gotta find that middle ground. Slowly, slowly catch the monkey. Slowly, slowly get an agility dog. <laughs> <laughs> slowly, slowly. But not a slow agility dog. No. 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 No, we want fast, confident. Oh gosh, that is something that a little bit too confident sometimes. That is something that that uh um people say to me, my dog's too fast. Oh my gosh. Don't ever try and slow your dog down. No, we want fast. Train through the fast. Train through the fast. And when your dog's fast, they're happy. Yeah, we we want fast. Well, thank you, Emma, for joining me. It was great to have you in person. And thank you everybody for joining us on Go Get Em Agility Podcast. Get out there and train your dog. Woof woof. <laughs> <laughs>